who is professor of medicine and, uh, medicine and pathology. Diego is among the foremost neuroscientists working on the link between the gut and the brain, exploring how the brain perceives what the gut feels and alters behavior. His work is transforming our understanding of the vital biological process for improving health outcomes and responding to our environment. And for those of you who are uh, eyeing the desserts in the reception afterward, you should pay particularly close attention to this presentation. <laughs> Diego. Thank you, uh, everybody, for having me here. How is everybody feeling? Yes. Great. Well, we're going to talk about gut feelings. <laughs> uh, so I thought that I would start by sharing a, a passage from uh, one of my favorite books. It really frames um, what not only what I study, but also my uh, entire career. And this book is actually written uh, by himself. And I brought uh, the original copy for, uh, for you guys. We usually don't take it on the road, but uh, this is a special, uh, special audience. And it says uh, the following. He sa it says, added uh, to these means, I had trusty messengers in every direction. And between myself, the stomach, and that individual, Mr. Brain, there was established a double set of electrical wires, the vagus nerve for some of you that uh, have heard about it, by which means I could, with the greatest ease and rapidity, tell him all the occurrences of the day as they arrive. And he also could impart to me his own feelings and impressions. Often, when he has received unwelcome intelligence, I have refused to digest out of pure sympathy. <laughs> and when occasionally I grew morose and refused to work, he too grew irritable and petulant. <laughs> what is surprising about this is that that is just a beautiful depiction of how it is that the gut talks to the brain. But today, we're talking about reading uh, technologies that can read our minds. We're putting people or trying to put people in Mars. But we still don't know how it is that the gut decodes the food that we eat to tell the brain what to eat. So this story begins uh, within the gastrointestinal uh, tract. So inside of the intestine, there is this lining of these finger-like uh, projections that are covered by a single layer of cells. These are epithelial cells. And within that uh, layer of cells, there is this peculiar cell that for about 115 years was known as enteroendocrine cell or a gut cell that produces hormones. But I had the fortune to uh, stumble upon uh, uh, this question of what it is that these cells do and how it is that they connect with the nervous system. And I stumbled upon it with uh, some new technologies. And we discovered that uh, these cells form a direct connection with the nervous system, opening a whole gate from the gut uh, to the brain. And I want to show you just, just one single uh, experiment and that was um, a pretty much a turning point, not only in my career, but in, in this whole uh, subject. So on your left side, what you're seeing is a single cell that has been isolated by fluorescence from the body of a special mouse in which these cells are uh, labeled by fluorescence. And on the right side, there is a single neuron from, uh, from the brain of a mouse. And we put them in a, in a dish, and we put them under a microscope, and you will see what happens. So that green cell not only has found that, uh, that neuron, it's moving around, it's pretty active. And after some time, that was the same feeling of awe, awe that I felt on uh, June 27, 2012. Uh, <laughs> 
because essentially this experiment brought up a multiple questions that not only these cells uh, can recognize a nurse, but they can actually recapitulate the circuitry even after they have been isolated from the body of, of an animal. And essentially, uh, over a series of exper experiments, we proved that uh, this connection is capable of converting signals from food into electrical pulses that go up into the vagus nerve and feed immediately into the brain. And this connection, in fact, is necessary for the vagus nerve and for the brain to feel the sugars that we eat. So, of course, I was not going to show you something that is already uh, published. I brought uh, here today, and I wanted to share with you in the next uh, uh, few minutes something very special that has been um, cooking in the laboratory for the last uh, four years, and we are about to submit it uh, for publication. So, ultimately, this is the circuitry or the basis of a new sense. Just like in, uh, in the tongue we have the ability to taste or in the nose we have the ability to smell, uh, the gut has its own sense. And you can imagine that we're all wired simply to find food. Once we find food and we find sustenance, then we can imagine bigger things. We can imagine hierarchy, we can imagine dreams, and we can imagine uh, awards. And we can imagine sitting here listening to a guy talking about the gut and the brain. But if you will be hungry, you probably will not be paying attention. So the gut, what it does is make sense of that food so we can continue to drive and find the sustenance that we need. And in this experiment, what I will tell you it is we build up uh, this uh, technology to be able to assay what it is that this connection is doing for the animal. And this, this technology, it is composed of two things. First, the ability to track behaviors. Whereas in humans, we are so advanced in tracking uh, human behaviors, in mice, we are still far behind in terms of uh, tracking behaviors. And this is a special uh, type of uh, cage that goes inside of a chamber and is equipped with multiple sensors in which we can uh, track the amount of food that the animals eat or like another type of food, so we can track choice. Uh, we can track body weight because the animal likes to hop on that, uh, on that beam. And we can also track the activity every five seconds for months at a time. So we put a mouse in there and we pretty much know, we don't know the mouse thoughts, but we really know like what the mouse likes or what he doesn't like. And using th this technology, we found that the animal within a few seconds, in fact, uh, we have titrated down, this is some early evidence, but within 90 seconds, the animal can tell what is sugar from a splenda. So what is a caloric sugar from a non-caloric uh, sweetener? And what is amazing is that the animal can actually tell these things even in the absence of taste. So if you put the sugar directly into the intestine, the animal will still learn that that is a good feeling, a good gut feeling, and will actually learn tasks. So then the second part of the technology, it is what we call, it has become to be known as optogenetics. Optogenetics is uh, taking some genes from algae. So in algae, they are capable of, they have these proteins that in the presence of light, they depolarize cells and they give electrical stimuli to the cells. And in that way, the, the algae can move to, towards certain uh, uh, places where there is more food. So in 2005, uh, uh, this technology was brought to mammals, and this is an animal that is completely sated and has these opsins in some neurons that control appetite. So when we turn the light, you see that that mouse cannot stop eating. When we turn off the light, then the mouse is, what am I doing? Why am I eating? <laughs> So this, this technology is really helping us to understand what are the neurons that control those areas uh, of the brain that give rise to certain behaviors. So in the laboratory, we have adapted that to the gut. And that was quite a bit of endeavor. This is one of our earlier uh, prototypes. <laughs> and then working with uh, some co collaborators uh, outside of, uh, of Duke University and uh, some friends, they devise these flexible fiber optic uh, cables that are necessary because the current uh, paradigms use these uh, stiff uh, fiber technologies that when you put them in the gut, they will puncture the wall of the gut. 
So that is not suitable. So we had to go and devise a whole new uh, fiber. This fiber is 200 microns and has about 32 lines of light within those 200 microns. And the beauty of this is that now this, this fiber, when it comes to a wall, is flexible. So it's fully compatible to live inside of the lumen of, uh, of the intestine. And now we are able to mount it on us. So this, this mouse just has that fiber uh, not penetrating the brain. It's just mounted on the skull so the mouse cannot take it out. And then like fed inside of the gut. And in this gut, these mice has these cells that are sensitive to light. They have been uh, genetically engineered. And you see that that mouse is happy and is running around. So now, moment of truth um, in, as I mentioned to you, the animal within seconds is capable of telling the sugar that has calories versus the artificial uh, sweetener. But now when we silence uh, the cells that we call neuropods, the animal becomes blind to calories. So this is a fundamental uh, finding, and we have actually found the reverse. If we, if we feed the animal a non-caloric sweetener, and now we stimulate these neuropod cells, the animal believes that it's getting calorie and consumes much as the regular uh, sugar. So you can t really tell that opens a, uh, an avenue to be able to treat the brain from the gut. And in closing, let me tell you a story that I often when I'm, uh, I'm on the road, I, uh, I, I, I share it with people because this is how I got started in this field. Back in 2006, when I was a, a PhD uh, a student in nutrition, uh, I had the opportunity to hear this story from a friend that uh, she underwent gastric bypass surgery. And she told me three things. She said that within six months of the surgery, she had lost about 40% of body weight. So for a person that was about 300 pounds, you're talking about she lost about 120 pounds or so, half herself. She also said that within one week of the surgery, her diabetes was gone. She didn't need more insulin shots, and as you, some of you may have heard, that is actually very reproducible in the clinic. Before the patients leave the clinic, uh, diabetes is already uh, in remission in some of these patients. But the thing that really uh, caught my eye was that she said, why it is that before the surgery, I could not even look at Sony Side Up X. The yolk will make me queasy. But after the surgery, not only I can eat those eggs, I actually have a craving uh, for for that, uh, for that yolk. So this really highlights that the gut has the ability to tell the brain where to go for food. And in the future, I believe that uh, with the support of the whole community, we will be able to devise uh, natural approaches so we can, we are able to treat not only diseases of, uh, like of appetite, like obesity, but also other uh, mental disorders from outside of the brain. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. So again, we have time for questions. There is a lot to digest, pardon for the pun. <laughs> yeah. Again, if you could, when you have a question, let us know. I, I, I have uh, one I'd like to ask. You mentioned uh, at, at some point, perhaps, that the, the gut could be used to target the brain. Um, how, how far along do you think we are in that? You've established the connections. We know how those connections work. What would it take uh, to identify some uh, pattern of brain behavior and actually know enough about that pattern and the gut to, to, to use the gut yeah. to get to the brain. So we have been using for millennia uh, food to be able to steer our brain, right? Like if you feel hungry, you go and eat and then you feel better, right? What we don't know is how to use the specific nutrients or a specific vehicles to be able to steer our feelings in a certain way. So microbiology has really taken a, a renaissance over the last uh, 10 years. And I believe that that is going to be at least one of the ways that this is going to be possible. So for instance, if we, re if 
Today, it is actually possible to repurpose a commensal microbe that lives normally in the gut and engineer some enzymes. So the microbe now will be able to sense a certain type of nutrient and then secrete a type of effector. And using that, one could imagine that that, that could be a way to naturally target what, is what would be called a functional uh, probiotic. <coughs> How far are we from that? I think that in the next five to 10 years, that is gonna be a possibility. And certainly that's gonna open a can of gummy worms for uh, <laughs> things like uh, policy and ethics. Yeah. Uh, we have a question here in the front row. David Howell, Trinity 76, now in the Department of Pathology. So Duke has one of a small number of centers in the United States that's now doing bowel transplants, small intestine. Some people get transplanted stem to stern all the way from the stomach down to the distal part of the GI tract. Has anyone looked to see whether there's a reestablishment of the neural connections that you've shown in the test tube and these transplanted organs? Uh, to my knowledge, People have not, uh, have not seen if those, if those connections are re-established after a, a transplant. I, I suspect that those connections, some of those connections are re-established because as you saw them in the dish, if, even if you take out that neuron, that neuron within 12 hours already grows uh, back in. But it's certainly an open question for uh, scientists to figure out. We had a question in the back, up in the corner. Yeah, all the way to the back. Oh. We, we have several in the very back of the room as well, and we'll come back down. Hey, uh, Chris here, uh, Trinity 01. Um, I, the question is whether you've actually done some of the work with the microbiome to see if you can get differences in the neuroendocrine cells production of different genes that might result in different signaling pathways. We are actively work, working on it. Uh, we have not done uh, work on it, but it's, uh, it is already known that there is a certain type of microbes that actually modulate the production of some of the neurotransmitters in these cells, like serotonin is one of those. And there are some companies out there that are actually actively working on how it is that some of these microbes may affect some behaviors beyond appetite, like even a sleep by altering uh, the signaling in the gut. Uh, I think that the challenge in the future is to be able to target the specificity of it. Because if we target the specificity of it, we can manage some of those behaviors and avoid the other ones that are undesirable. And then there was a question about halfway down. Yes. Uh, we have a very big weight loss industry, which is financially successful, but only questionably successful on long-term weight loss. How can your work help the weight loss industry do better? So that is a very important point because uh, at some point I was in a conference and I was seeing the prospect of the, uh, the drugs that are out there and the drugs that are in the pipeline for being able to treat um, a, uh, body weight issues and, and obesity. And unfortunately it is pretty slim, the options are pretty slim, and most of them are focused around the release of hormones from the gut. And often what happens is that there are some side effects ac uh, associated with it. Like for instance, there is some uh, weight loss reduction, but there is inflammation of the pancreas. Um, and that is really a no-go for a lot of these, um, uh, these therapies. So this, this technology, I, I believe that in the future, what it's gonna allow us to do is to modulate the desire to continue eating for the reward of the food. Let me explain a little bit what I, what I mean by, by that. Partly of why we, uh, a huge component of why we eat is because of the feeling of the reward of the food. Because if we don't get that reward, if we don't get that calorie, then eventually the brain on its own will adapt to a different type of, uh, a different type of nutrient. So if we will have the ability to modulate specifically this connection and tamper down the desire to continue eating that nutrient in a progressive way, within like a couple of months or three months, it is, one could see that in the future, what a, 
this desire to continue consuming a certain type of nutrient that will increase body weight could be reduced and body weight could be managed. Okay. And, and would there be applications to addictions as well? Different, maybe not directly in the gut, but, it, but if the mechanisms are understood, does it have applications? Yes, there? and in fact, uh, uh, it's very interesting that uh, it has been reported that uh, in people that undergo gastric bypass surgery, there is a surge in the, uh, in the incidence of alcoholism. So people that have uh, gastric bypass surgery, there is actually a hint that a seven-fold increase in the rate of uh, alcoholism. So it is partly connected with this uh, reward signaling. Yes. Yes. Uh, my name is Gabriela Zavala, and I graduated in 2009 at 69 years old. Wonderful. <laughs> oh, wow. I'm very interested about your research, especially now that you said something about the alcoholism. Um, from what I had done research, I do that on my side, even though that's not my field that I study here. I believe that there is a connection, and you will let me know if you have thought about that, that really eating as well as alcoholism or many other things, it's really an addiction. So if, you, if we don't treat about the connection that is also this disease, obesity, with the work of the stomach that has also the, the neurons and all that, um, might not be so successful. Because like you're saying, um, you, were you trying to do different than uh, what they did with the operation of the stomach? But um, I think that there is a link between that and also addiction. So. I, I would like to know if you had thought about that and what, you, what have you discovered? Uh, yeah, so in, in, in a way, uh, the gastric by, bypass surgery is what has opened the opportunity for us to even imagine how it is that the gut is controlling our desires uh, to eat and our choices of food. And this, this research, what it's bringing is like zeroing down into a specific cell type that now we can go at it with in, in future research with approaches, perhaps like I mentioned some microbes, there is also medicinal plants that could be used and could be packaged to be able to target some of the receptors in these cells. And by that tamper that those cravings and those desires to uh, continue eating. So, oh, go ahead. Uh, the microphone to the front here would be great. Um, it just, it seems more than anything that this would be just a promotion of eating disorders. I mean, just if you, like, telling people, okay, you don't have to eat, you know, you, your stomach isn't, so it would be unhealthy in a way. Yes, so eating has, is, a, is a double edge, right? Uh, eating you can overeat or you can undereat. And essentially this connection, what is, uh, what is controlling, it is not only the overeating, but also the undereating. Because if you can feel full all the time, then you can perhaps end up undereating and that is also not healthy. And what we don't know yet is how it is that some of these connections are uh, feeding into those areas of the brain that are recognizing us as I had enough versus I need more. You know? And I think that in, in, in what we know are the signals that are feeding into like, for instance, right now, one of the areas that I didn't go into uh, is that these cells use two different uh, neurotransmitters, two different chemical molecules to be able to encode for the caloric sugar versus the non-caloric sugar. And we suspect that at the same time, they will have another molecule to be able to tell you whether you're full or how you should feel about uh, food. And once we know those signals, it could be, we could modulate in a more targeted manner, whether it is treatment for overeating or treatment for undereating. Well, please join me in thanking Diego Borges.